Welcome to lecture number two of our Tuesday night lecture series of five. Yeah. Um, tonight we're going to be looking at some portfolios from some of your fellow classmates, talking about file management, which is important and underutilized. And we have Jen here from Behance to talk to you about that product. And hopefully you all have your, what, your laptops with you. Yeah. So we are actually going to create accounts, user accounts tonight, if you don't already have them. Okay? Before you load up everything you have on that site, I want you to talk with your faculty who teach your IL 351 or 451 class about how to choose the work you're going to upload and what the right timing is for that. Okay? Tonight we're going to learn about that this particular experience and the pros and cons of how to use it and the things that you might want to do as you move forward with that. Okay? Um, the other thing I want to remind you is that we did have an assignment from the last lecture, which was to go to Career Services, right? Register with them, upload a portfolio on College Central, make an appointment, and work on drafting that cover letter, resume, and artist statement. You have the semester, but I'm not getting great reports for those that have actually followed up with this. So the clock is ticking. It's almost October 1st, right? So the first part of the evening will be for a number of your fellow classmates to share with you the work they have in their portfolios, physical portfolios, that they have created and have targeted specific industries and illustrations that they want to go into professionally. Some of whom have had internships in those areas, others who have done work in those different sectors. Okay? <laughs> it's like a headlight. Um, they'll each spend about five minutes walking through their portfolios and talking about them a little bit. We won't have a lot of time for questions tonight, but the goal is at the end of your semester this, this fall, you will create a portfolio for your illustration class, right? Based upon your faculty's input and requirements, all right? Are there any general questions then about what's expected tonight and previously moving forward? All right, so leading off tonight, Libby. with Hallmark this summer. Um, try to flip these pages without knocking anything over. Um, I tried to focus uh, most of my work to combine illustration and hand lettering since that's something that I'm extremely interested in. Uh, so these are some book covers that I have done in my computer illustration course. Flip through many pages here. Um, I'm just showing a highlight, so if anyone is interested in seeing more, um, why don't you visit my website, Google me. Okay, um, so at the top of all my pages, I have this uh, logo type icon thing, which is also on my resume and my cover letters and everything. Um, it's kind of like my little identity stamp. And I just created these pages by making a template in InDesign. And I know a lot of people are scared of InDesign for some reason, but templates are there to help you, so use them. Um, it's really easy to just place my Photoshop files and Illustrator files right into that document. Everything is um, the same across my whole book as far as layout. Since I knew that I was interested in um, creating cards and possibly ending up at Hallmark, I went ahead and targeted a lot of my open assignments in my illustration courses towards that. And in my book then, I included um, samples of some of those product. So I have actual cards that um, 
be pulled out and you can see you know functionality of them and how I was thinking as I was designing um, which is really nice because it's one thing to have it designed but it's another thing to have it as a tangible item that someone can mess around with again you can see that I'm uh, combining hand lettering into almost all of my projects uh, more samples cards hand lettering um, I really knew what I wanted to do, so it wasn't hard to focus my book. Um, think about using uh, different uh, capabilities and technologies that are available to, here, to you here at Ringling. I made this card um, using the laser cutter, which was a really fun and easy process, actually. Um, so as it folds, it's, the concept of it was fun. It's a, a card with a cold symbol on it of a snowflake. But it's created from um, warm symbols, scarves, coffee cups, and winter hats. Um, again, using the laser cutter, I was able to create this um, this piece. It's about 11 by 17, and then also these uh, snowflake assets that could be, you know, any sort of product made by. Oh, that one broke. <laughs> made by made by Hallmark. Um, okay, I'm just gonna. That's upsetting. That broke. That's okay. Um, I also decided to include in my book a separate section just for sketches. It's usually encouraged that you submit a sketchbook depending on which recruiter you're applying to. And so, um, since I draw in multiple sketchbooks, I just compiled what I consider my best or more applicable sketches to show. Um, so I was showing here that I mean I have drawing ability. But I also wanted to highlight um, my interest in hand lettering. So I have several spreads that display you know, each of those areas of interest and expertise. And that's, I mean, that's all I'm going to show. But my, right. book, my book has a lot more work. So fill your, work, fulfill your book, but only with um, good work. So. Target, thanks. Thanks, Libby. Concept design for entertainment. Okay. Hey, I'm Gal. Uh, so I'm focusing on illustration and concept design for entertainment, which is games, films, VFX companies. Um, most of my work is um, mood paintings uh, that include uh, environment design, uh, end curve design, and uh, keyframe illustration. Um, the way the portfolio is built is basically um, <coughs> some of the strongest pieces first. Um, and I decided that by basically what I know people react to, um, whether like my friends here or on Facebook, or wherever I put my work out. Um, as far as genre, it's usually fantasy, sci-fi, and some modern stuff. Uh, I include uh, some work in progress to show my process and other ideas um, on the way to the final piece. Uh, and after separate images, uh, I included some uh, projects. So this is one I did in my independent study, which I took a, a book and adapted it into a film. So there's some of the chosen um, environments, characters, sketches. And you can see that um, the portfolio design is spread, so you need to think about both pages when you open up a book. And some special effects design. So 
since it's a big thing in VFX services. and keyframe illustrations. <coughs> and finally, I um, included some traditional drawing and painting, since you can see that most of the jobs require, they listed in the skills that they require knowledge of anatomy and traditional painting and drawing. Uh, so I included some examples of that. And Ryan Gosling. <laughs> And that's it. All right, thank you. Charlotte, children's book illustration is target interest. Um, the first thing, I guess, is... thing so it would stand out in the pile of black um, It's not really anything but it does show like the colors I like to use and kind of my style and I also have my name and phone number and all that good stuff. So I have a title page. I don't know if they're necessary but Marcelli had one and I copy everything she does. <laughs> so I have um, my name on the top of every page, just in case someone's gonna take a page out and take it with them. That happened to me with American Greetings. They took a couple pages out. Um, and then I have, at the bottom, I put text for the pieces that have been in shows. I don't know if it should be consistent and just have a title for everything. Okay, Teal's saying yes. Um, the text is also a little too big, but it's consistent. So. So I just focused my work um, on using bright colors and anything. I, I'm just interested in doing any sort of kids' illustrations, so greeting cards or you know like carters or anything like that. Um, one of the things that Perez said was not to have too many pieces. That they're just like characters staring directly at you, you want to have characters that are interacting. This one was for um, a character study, so that's why it's like that, but something to keep in mind. That was a series for the St. Pete Times. Um, birds. <laughs> and then uh, I also have a sketchbook area. Since I don't really keep sketchbooks, I do mostly like this is what I would do instead of keep a sketchbook, I just go on the computer and do a little piece like this. So I thought instead of handing in a sketchbook, I would keep the pages in the back. And that's it. And get rid of all the pages at the end because it looks like you don't have enough work. All right, Audrey, please. Book illustration, visual development for animation and film. Audrey. Hi. 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 <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, this is my portfolio. Um, I, I got the um, the actual portfolio case through Blick. They have really great options if you want to kind of alter it from the, the standard kind of thin plastic one. So um, you want something that they're going to hold on to. Um, so yeah, I'm interested in like editorial and um, freelance stuff, but I'm also interested in um, concept art and character design. So eventually my goal for this year is going to have like two separate portfolios, but this is like a general overview of all of the things that I do and it um, transitions throughout. So, um, so yeah, cover page. Um, Um, so I start off with like some stronger, like more painterly illustrations. 
Um, I do a lot of stuff for poetry, like storybook style. I'm really into combining and experimenting with, um, with traditional mediums and digital. And um, that's why I got really interested in Leica this year, because I like that they do that with animation. The um, com combination of the two. So you'll see that a lot in my, um, in, like, my posters. And I use graphite a lot in my process. And I like when the um, when the roughness shows through. Um, these would be potential book covers. I would really like to do book covers and then ha and then like also be the person that does the um, the drawings throughout. So Some personal pieces, storybooks. And then as a transition, I like to I wanted to include some of the things from my sketchbook that I worked a little bit on, just like my experiment, um, to transition into my character design stuff. So some happy little silverware and some purses, how jolly. <laughs> um, lots of variations of things. Cats, good, especially dancing cats. <laughs> Characters, I like to do um, uh, character designs of um, ones that people already know, so they have like a sense of familiarity and I can add my own flair to it, kind of like as a, an own, like a prompt to myself. So, excuse me, I did um, the Charlie and the Chocolate Factory people this summer. Oh wait, that's the complete You know what, that's fine. <laughs> you didn't get to see that one sideways. <laughs> Um, there you go. Um, I, I enjoy like um, darker subject matters, so I also feel that helps like a feel more appropriate for me. Um, a murder mystery story, character studies. traditional work. Um, this is my Meanwhile comic from last year. Meeting tomorrow. Yay. <laughs> um, I've also uh, dabbled in some card design and stuff. So, Libby, so inspirational. <laughs> and then I'm ending my portfolio. Since I have more uh, like sketchbook things throughout the middle, I ended it with um, some observational painting and um, and some studies. So I'm really into like plant life. That's how I gather my information for like my visual development stuff. So yeah, so figure. And then I just. And then I just ended it with like a, a newer illustration piece. So. Yeah. Thank you, Audrey. <laughs> Designs for each illustration I do. So, so both of these characters would be for this illustration, um, and then I'll have a process to go with it. Um, so I'll show my thumbnails and my color keys. character thumbnails and variations of those characters. Um, I also like taking like um, 
fairy tales and stories are done before and just redesigning them. So it goes on Robin Hood. Um, and also some of my stuff could be based for um, video games, uh, which that's the internship that I did over the summer for Insomniac. So they picked me up with uh, this piece in particular. So it's more video game based. Um, some ZBrush stuff. Um, more land landscape stuff and it's important to have um, processes and different thumbnails and color keys to go for your illustration just to show them that you're thinking about different variations. Um, Moby Dick. I usually like to do like turnarounds and expressions as well to go with them. So even if it's just like a random character with no illustration to go with it, I like to do like a render of the character and I like to turn them in space and then have a different expressions to show like the animation department. Uh, this one is more of a environment, um, but then I go ahead and do the same thing. And I do a different variations of the important part of the environment and different props that would be inside the environment. And yeah, just adapting older stories, if they turn around and say, uh, different variations of the characters. And yeah, that's about it. personal touch. My name and last name has 18 letters, which is very unfortunate, but <laughs> you know, I try to make it as you know, designy as possible with as many letters as that. So, you know, you can handle it like a pronunciation. On my Tumblr, I actually have a little you know, pronunciation thing. So if you have a very hard name, you should probably consider doing that. It makes it easier for the employers to do that. <laughs> It's harder. And then I do the same in my um, cover. You know, it's a lot of stuff. I'm, I'm very good at things that are, you know, I'm going to do. And yeah, the same thing. So, so in my portfolio, I get some sticker paper to put it on the thing. You know, so if you see it, you're going to know it's me because all the left of me. Then I do it again. <laughs> Not sure if it's necessary, but at this point I'm just having my website and you know, the information I need. And um, what I want to go into is sort of like a freelance situation when I'm doing only what I want to do kind of thing. So in my portfolio I'm thinking of showing only the things I'm capable of and not any uh, more traditional work, which I don't want to do. Like I, I'm not going to include printmaking or painting because that's not what I'm going to do. But um, this summer I thought that I don't have any environments at all. Like I draw people, you know, just people standing there, awful. You know, so I thought, well, I should include more stuff like this, you know, people doing things and interacting with each other and in the building. So then I also did some children's book stuff, it's actually in Polish, apparently the hardest language in the world. Um, so then some cover for books, Pride and Prejudice, some process. And as you can see, what I'm going with is like this little line at the bottom that's like a personal touch with like my information, my phone number, and so on. And then I also did some patterns, they're repeating, I'm very proud of them because it's hard, like really. <laughs> and um, more sort of editorial illustration stuff. This one was for a poem. And then some personal work. She got the best of England last year, this one. That's my profile, that's my ex-profile. <laughs> 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 well, more, more book covers. 
I, I really enjoy, you know, that sort of metaphorical work, more based on symbols. But some type that I actually can draw, which I should do more of, because if you're showing something, you have to show that you're really good at it. So just showing one or two is not enough. And then more work like this. Christmassy stuff. <laughs> um, so then I did sort of like character development, but not really. I'm just showing, you know, fashion style. Abercrombie would like to have their own clothes drawn like this. Again. I hope. <laughs> More of, you know, what, which colors would they choose? Like thinking in terms of fashion. And then with that character or non-character, should I say, I have some, you know, shoes and hats. You know, again, type and characters. Hats. <laughs> and that's my meanwhile comic, which I have actually embraced some controversy because it's too sexual. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's my senior portrait right now. Uh, it doesn't actually look like me, but I would like that to be me, so it's okay. <laughs> some dead man, you know, some feminist German rats and stuff. And um, what I think I need to include more of is my product design. So I was designing some packaging for yarn. And, uh, you know, just more editorial and then more patterns. And then showing what can happen with a pattern, you know, like how mood influences each pattern and the colors. And then I end up with something funny. So people can remember me as funny after looking at all the moves now. And that's the part of so I'm basically showcasing what I like and what I would like to do. And I'm hoping people will respond to that when they go looking for a job. That's it. sophomore year for shoes 
and I tried to like include the entire process, like how we opened all the way to like here. And this was they always said to end in your portfolio with a really good piece. I think this was this one of my favorites. And yeah, that's what I was. This is something I did for my internship this this summer at a gallery where they wanted a, a graphic designer and somebody that was fluent in Spanish would like kind of help me. So that's what I going to on next. Yeah. All right. So one quick thing on the end there. Um, one thing you'll notice: all those portfolios, not only being exceptional examples, but all using typography in a very deliberate, <laughs> conscious way. And I know that some of you in this class we have right now, the junior class, have questions about that class. <laughs> yeah, I know who you are. I want you to talk to me if you have an issue or question about the curriculum or how it's going, okay? I'm available to meet with you, and I'm opening that up as an opportunity to have a conversation. Discuss the arc of the class, the goals we have for it, and why we feel it's of value, okay? We've thought about it a fair amount. We've been doing deliberate work to develop a course that we feel benefits you and we treat, are treating you like serious designers. I'm not saying it's fun. I'm not here to entertain you. This isn't Disneyland. That means education isn't always a good time, but the, the goal is the value of it is going to serve you long term beyond the class. So please let me know if you want to get together and have a chat. Okay. The next person I'm going to introduce you to is Steve Maybe, and he is going to talk about file management. No? Shaking his head. Steve. Hello. <laughs> I get to talk about the best thing tonight, I'm going to tell you. So, um, I'm Steve Maybe. Um, a part-time faculty for the VizDev thing, and um, I just want to talk to you a little bit about, um, you know, right now um, in the industry, you know, it's, uh, you know, the digital media is a pretty big part of it, and it's so much easier to organize what you're doing, um, you know, digitally now. Um, and so I'm going to kind of run through these slides and show you guys a few ideas and examples of how to successfully <laughs> clean up your um, you know, your workflow. So manage your digital images like a pro. <laughs> um, you know, in, in the industry that I come from, you know, in production, um, it's important that all your work is consistent so that anybody in any part of the pipeline can, um, you know, pick up your images and really be able to clearly read and understand your process and your workflow. So. You know, as a professional, that's part of your job. It's not just to make great images, it's to make great images that anyone can understand. <clears throat> Why is this important? <clears throat> Promotes a better workflow for you personally. Um, you know, if your files are clean, you know, you're, you're always capable of going back and understanding everything that you're doing. Um, allowing for clear communication between your peers and colleagues, again, you know, if you're on a team of a production, a production team of concept artists, you know, you're one of five or whatever, um, you know, you're not always going to be just working on your one image. Sometimes you're going to have to trade off, someone might have to pick off where you pick up where you left off. And uh, when that happens, if you have 50,000 unladen layers, you know, you're, that guy's probably going to be slashing your tires. So, um, you know, you've got to kind of think of that stuff and, um, you know, be professional um, and keep that stuff clean. Keeping your file sizes low and easy to manage. This is a huge thing that I see with a lot of junior artists that I hired or have hired in the past. Um, you know, they uh, they have so much, so many layers. You know, the DPI is ridiculous. You know, they think everything has to be, you know, insanely large, and uh, you know, it doesn't have to be. You know, it's actually better for you. You know, you don't want to spend the first five minutes of a, uh, a daily, which is, you know, a meeting that you'll have with your team, with the art director waiting for you to open your images. So, you know, that's bad for you. It helps keep you keep painting, right? If you're sitting there searching, looking for, you know, a certain layer that you want to adjust something and you don't know what it is, I come to your desk. Um, for example, in my class, I come to your desk, I want to see your, your images and I ask you to pull something up or, you know, change something and then those students are digging through their files 
that's killing time. So you know, it's not a good thing to do. So it's really good for you to know your files in and out, and uh, you know, be able to go to the exact thing that you're looking for. So um, I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about maybe uh, some poor examples of uh, you know file management <laughs> and uh, some good examples. You know, my friend Jackie Chan, you know, is pretty frustrated with us. Um, <laughs> So uh, this is what I'll see, you know, I, I took one of my files and I tried to kind of emulate what I saw, you know, a lot of people in the industry, you know, they'd hand me these huge, you know, just massive files and, uh, you know, I would get them and I'd be searching on these layers and I just, I want to have a head, like my head to it blow up, you know, I'm just, I don't even know what to make of this, right? You know, so really kind of think about how you lay out your files because really in a production line, especially in, um, you know, entertainment, you're not the last person to see this image or to deal with this image for the most part. Um, you know, people usually rip it up all the way down to the marketing. So, um, you know, really think about that stuff as you guys organize your files or, you know, kind of get in the habit of doing that. So here's a, you know, a better example of, um, you know, how to manage your files. It's the exact same painting. I have all my adjustment layers still there. Um, I have all my effects on certain layers. You know, I use smart objects to compress my files. Um, and then I have all my unused assets down at the bottom so that if there is ever a reason somebody needs to go down there, like, for example, a variation on a rough sketch that I did for, you know, this image pitch, um, it's all there. But it's easy to read and easy to find, right? It's like false. Okay, so that kind of leads us into, you know, um, you know, now that you've kept your files, you know, organized internally in whatever software you use, say Illustrator or Photoshop, or whatever, whatever have you, you know, let's talk a little bit about creating yourself, you know, a, a good library, right? Because I don't know about you guys, but it's 3 a.m., you're super tired, you've been working on this thing, you're saving images all over the place, and then you wake up in the next morning and you're like, who came into my house and destroyed everything? Because that's what happens to me sometimes. And, uh, you know, I really had to get out of that habit of just saving things anywhere for convenience because it always screws you in the end. <clears throat> so, create simple and easy to understand folder structures. It sounds pretty self-explanatory, but, you know, you go to some kid's computer or some junior artist's computer at their work and, um, you know, their personal or local drive is just a disaster. So they're not there for the day, you have to pick up something or whatever. Example you might have, um, you know, you run into those situations in the industry. So, you know, keep your stuff very clear. You know, in class I talk about, you know, keep everything clean, consistent, and clear. You know, the three C's or whatever. So, it's uh, it's very important to just kind of blanket over everything that you do. Using naming conventions. Um, you know, I'm going to learn from the school too, and. Uh, that was something I never even knew. So I would write sentences when I would save my files out, and then you get in, you know, to a produ production setting, and they're like, "Holy crap! What is this? You know, 15 lined Photoshop file? You know, no one needs to read any of that stuff." So, um, you know, learning what a naming convention is, and uh, we'll go over that too. Um, will really save you a lot of time, and it'll save anybody else that is actually using your images uh, a lot of time. Use iterations to manage your file progress. This is another thing. Photoshop, all digital files, they corrupt sometime, you know, and you're gonna be in one of those moments where you're gonna lose a lot of work, and uh, that's your only file, so that means you lost everything. And that's happened to me before, rookie move, um, but you know, now that I've introduced this to you, I want you guys to kind of think about it, you know, the, the CA department and all those guys that kind of ingrain this stuff early, um, but you should really think about, you know, saving iterations of your illustrations process because uh, if you lose something you lose it forever <laughs> backing up your files on the cloud this is another really important thing um, you know I have an external drive I'm sure a lot of you do or some space don't just have one copy of your images you know um, back them up on Google Drive for example you know um, it's a free easy way of doing so zip everything up put it up there you know just save it for a rainy day when you know your dog eats your drive or whatever else might happen. Um, you know, that stuff, it sounds, like I'm saying, a lot of this stuff sounds redundant, but you'd be surprised how many people are like, oh crap, all that's gone. So, uh, you know, really keep all these things in mind because um, they'll save you a lot of pain. So I just made a quick little example here of, 
you know, a pretty clear way of organizing your folders. You know, there'd be a top end of the folders, you know, if the tree would go something like, this is my artwork or whatever, right? And then you would say, this is my freelance work, and then we kind of get into the meat of it. You know, you've got all your stuff clearly named, every product that you use or every brand, right, for Fantasy Flight, Hasbro, Battlestar Galactica, whatever you worked on, right? Um, you know, this could be anything. And then as we drill down into them, you know, you start seeing your company legal information in a folder for every assignment, you know, because that stuff's important. You know, you might do multiple work for these companies, but you want to make sure that the correct legal documentation is with the actual images that it worked on. You know, you don't want to get it lost in the of documentation. You're just like, oh, this is all my legal stuff, and you got 4,500 documents in there. That's probably going to cause you a lot of pain. So. Um, you know, be very wary of that kind of stuff and really try to help yourself because there's going to be a moment, especially when you need to do your taxes, that this stuff is going to have to come back up. So, um, you know, really think about that. You know, as you drill down, then you've got the subject matter of your illustrations. Um, you know, there might be multiple parts to illustrations, um, you know, like the image you saw up there um, that I had shown the poor layers and, the, you know, better layers of, you know, um, I actually had to do two different versions of it. There's like an advanced version and a regular version. So sometimes you have a multiple piece illustration that you have to kind of work with. Um, and then as you open those files, you know, you kind of see that I'm dealing with, you know, my naming convention. Um, you know, I have multiple versions of it. So, you know, I made it clear and easy for me to understand. Um, so, naming conventions, you know, they can be pretty easy. They don't need to be complex, you know. Um, I would just say, uh, you know, you can you can have the image title. You know, that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, for this area here, you know, usually it's your artist name if you're doing freelance. Every, then everybody knows it's your image. Or you can put the product name. Let's say you work for Tron or something like that. You know, Tron could Tron Legacy could go there or whatever, right? So um, you know, really kind of think about making your naming conventions really easy to read for you, but even easier to read for Teal. Right? Because he's a different person than you. So, um, so again, very short image description. Right? Um, it doesn't have to be this little cat in the trees. You know, it doesn't have to be this long, crazy thing. You know, just kind of a simple thing that will remind you and anybody that's contracted you to do this work will know what this is. Right? So this could be battle scene. You know, this could be advanced because that's what this illustration was. Um, you know, just. A really simple phrase, you know, the one word is probably more preferable. It's pretty obvious, you know, this is your iteration number. Um, it's good to have iterations, you know, that's a huge thing. It's almost creating a backup of your process. Um, you don't want to run into those, you know, those moments where you lose a lot of work. And I mean, that's the biggest thing that I hear all the time. Oh, I lost all my days of work. You know, I'm like, well, that's tough luck, you know. I'm paying you to, to get this done. You should have thought of that. And this can be, you know, interchanged with Illustrator, Photoshop, Maya, whatever you package you decide to do your illustrations in. Um, you know, I just put that there to illustrate, you know, the basic file structure. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's kind of what I have for you. Um, you know, if you can successfully do this stuff, um, you know, it'll make everything a lot easier for you in the long run. And if you do it consistently, um, you know, it's going to be much more rewarding, and you don't have to worry about this stuff. You don't have to worry about finding your images. You know, everything's properly organized for yourself and anybody else in a production setting. <clears throat> so yeah, I mean, once you guys got all that stuff out there, you know, it's time to get it out there. You know, show yourselves, self promo, and. Uh, So the last presenter of the evening is Jen from Bean Hands. Come on up, Jen. As I said, she's going to walk you through the product, talk to you about this, and you will be using it in your class. But before you start loading it up, be sure you talk with your faculty member about uh, the way you're going to manage your content. And do not leave when she's done. I have one more thing for you to do, because you've all gone to the website I created for you, right? Yeah? Let's see it. How many of you have actually gone to the website? Okay. We're all going there tonight. All right, Jen, go ahead. Thank you. Can I? Oh, great. I can walk around. Um, 
So, I, full disclosure, I'm not an illustrator, um, but I do work for a company called Behance, and we work with all kinds of creatives, so a lot of illustrators, um, people that focus in industries like product design, fashion, architecture, um, you name it, as long as there is a visual and creative component to their work. So, um, let me see if I can, do I have to point this thing? There we go. Um, what is Behance? So I'd love to just start by getting a gauge of how many people in the room have either been to Behance. Maybe just raise your hands, raise them high so I can see. Oh, amazing. A lot of you. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for having me. I'm going back to New York. Um, no, and how many people have created portfolios and uploaded their work? Awesome. Okay, cool. This is a really healthy number. I go to a lot of art and design colleges and sometimes people are like, Beyonce? Oh, no, no, Behance. I've never. Um, so great. So could anyone, does anyone know what it is? If anyone could shout out, you know, just quickly, what, what would you say if you were trying to explain to, like, your mom what Behance is? Great. So she said digital portfolio hosting. That's, it's exactly right. Um, anyone else? Perfect. Like LinkedIn, but for creatives. Um, I love that definition because for people who maybe aren't so tech savvy, they do have a, somewhat of an understanding of LinkedIn. Um, but you know, for creative people, LinkedIn is really, really limiting. Um, so that's where Behance comes into play. And it's really a network in the same way that hiring managers and prospective employers can use to find work. Um, but it's also a place that creative people can display their work and let the visual component and their, and their art speak for itself. So thank you, those were both really you hit the nail on the head. Um, we're also just, you know, as a bit of a background before I get into the nitty gritty, we're also the leading platform for online creative work and that's really why Ringling has partnered with us. Um, we were a really small company based out of this tiny loft in Soho um, until this year and now we're actually part of Adobe. So we're working on a lot of things um, that involve integrating with the bigger, you know, Adobe company so that if you're working with Photoshop or InDesign or Illustrator, you can actually publish your files directly from those programs onto the site. So that's why we're, you know, we're sort of the biggest one and we're working with a lot of um, institutions in case you were, you were wondering where that partnership came from. Um, has anyone, I know we had a, a number of hands go up for the main Behance network, but has anyone been to the Ringling site yet? Okay, great, awesome. So the URL for that is portfolios.ringlingcollege.me, for those of you who didn't raise your hands. Um, and essentially, this is our way of licensing out our technology, licensing out the, all of the um, things we've developed for Behance for schools. So this is a, a, a portfolio site that Ringling is going to be using um, not only in the classroom, but long after you graduate. So this is something that's being sent to hiring managers or recruiters who, who say, you know, I'm interested in hiring from Ringling, where can I see the work? And uh, one of the great things is that they can actually filter by a number of different components that we'll get into a little bit further, you know, like <coughs> tags, project tags, things like that. But you can also sort if they want to um, enter it at a more broader scope, like by illustration, and browse all the work there. So by including your work up there, it's a really great way to make sure you're um, going to be found and discovered and just have more uh, opportunity for exposure. So. Um, I think that if we have time, um, it would be great if we could actually go to the live site and look at you know, uploading a project. But before I do that, I just wanted to speak a little bit to uh, the things we've learned from self-promotion. And so many of the things that I talked about tonight I was seeing in the portfolios that were shown. They, they were amazing, so that was fantastic. Um, so I guess really where we're coming at it is that sometimes when people have an incredible physical book and their actual portfolio uh, is really beautiful and and concise and consistent, um, when they go to put their work online, there's a disconnect. It's like they're, they're able to sit in front of you and talk about their work, and then when they try to you know, share it online, it doesn't always translate. So that's, you know, I really narrowed down um, five areas that I think can really make a difference and can really help as you go to put your work up there. Um, so the first thing is to edit yourself. I know that seems obvious, um, but your portfolio is only as good as your worst project. And sometimes on student galleries, what we'll see is that people will upload everything they've ever done. And uh, I think that, there's, that that's really misleading because it's not impressive if you have you know, 20 projects. What's impressive is if you have three that you're willing to stand behind and you're super proud of. Um, 
So this is an example of an illustration um, profile. I really love Glenn's work. He's been in the industry for over 20 years. He could have 18 pages worth of projects, but he chooses to have two. Sometimes it goes up to three, but you'll see that as he adds new work, sometimes he'll take older stuff down. So really editing yourself and kind of being a curator for your own portfolio comes into play when you're thinking of you know, putting on your business hat and your, and your self-marketing hat. Um, showing relevant work. Um, this was something that Libby, is it Libby? You did so well. So you said, you know, I know I want to work for a greeting card company. And maybe before you knew that, and before you had that realization, you had done some character work or, you know, something completely different where you designed, you know, an invitation for a friend's wedding and you were like, I hated that. I never want to do invitations. I want to focus on greeting cards. Don't put the wedding invitation in your profile. Like, that's something that seems really obvious, but we see it all the time where people will say, you know, it's funny, I keep getting hired for these same jobs. They're jobs I don't want to do. Then remove the work from, from your, uh, your online brand. So this is a, a great example. Florian, um, she has a really distinct style of illustration and her projects are really consistent. And what I love about it is that as she acquires new clients and new freelance projects, they know, they have a clear understanding of what they're going to get. And I think that she's done a really good job of showing what we like to call relevant work. Um, respect your work. So this comes into a lot of um, what we just learned about in file naming and it also uh, relates to, you know, proofreading everything that you're putting online, making sure that you're triple checking your descriptions, sending your profile to a friend before you hit publish so that you can make sure that you're making the absolute best first impression. And what I mean by that is that you don't always have the opportunity to sit in front of somebody and explain to them, you know, this is what I did and this is how I came up with my ideas. So when you're relying on an online space or your, your own website or Behance in some cases to do that for you, to have a spelling mistake or a low res image or um, something that isn't clear is really gonna be to your disadvantage. Um, so this is an illustration project that I thought was really great because she explains, you know, this was a project that she did for her senior portfolio, um, that she was rebranding a local bakery shop. She sort of sets the tone and tells a bit of the story. You'll see as I'm scrolling through, this is, these are screenshots I took from her Behance site. Um, so you can see, you know, she has a ton of views on this. Um, where it says appreciations for those of you who haven't been on Behance, it's kind of like a like button on Facebook. Um, so other creatives who've appreciated her work. And she has over 100 comments. So you can see that she's getting a lot more stats here than she would if this work was just on maybe her personal Tumblr or her personal domain. So that's part of the, the power of the platform. But anyway, back to the point of um, you know, really spending time on your description. Uh, I think she's done a great job in showing that she was doing a rebranding, she developed the logo, she's showing how it was used, and she's using, using beautiful imagery of those assets. So she's not just saying, you know, oh, and then it was put up on a website. She shows this really crisp, clean landing page, um, sorry, and she's showing also that it was turned into a sticker and she has a beautiful image of that too. Um, next, be descriptive. So because a lot of projects are often collaborative, um, one piece of feedback that we get from people that use Behance to hire on a regular basis is that they want to know what a creative's exact role was. So I know that um, you know, for some of your schoolwork, maybe you've created everything uh, that, that you're showing. You were involved in every single part from the concept to the development to the execution. But listing that out is really helpful because that's not obvious to everyone. Somebody might wonder, you know, was there an art director involved? Um, did, was somebody else involved with project management? So giving either credits or listing exactly, you know, how you came from point A to point B can be really helpful. Um, so this is just an example of, you know, he has a lot of text, but you don't always have to do it that way. You can do it visually as well. But he's just saying that, you know, this was a really fun project, but he also uh, speaks to the challenges. He's saying my role was to, you know, create this typography book, but I also had a tight timeline. And these were the, the objectives the client had, and this was how I met them. So I think that can be really helpful for somebody who's wondering what it might be like to work with you to gain insight into your process. Um, which leads me to the next point of sharing your process. So showing rough sketches, iterations, and mock-ups, um, that's something we saw a lot of in the portfolios that were shown tonight. 
Um, and I think that it really gives people a greater understanding into the work that went into your finished piece. Um, so this is an example of a campaign that was done for Amnesty International. And they start off by showing you know, the finished work. And again, I'm just going to call out on the right-hand side, you know, look at the, the amount of views that they're getting on a work like this. Like that's, that's like what you know, people would say is a, a work going viral. And this stuff often gets picked up on like Adweek and Huffington Post and, and so forth, because they're coming to the site looking for great work. Um, but anyway, so they start by showing the, the finished project and they give credits, what we were just talking about. So they say that this was agency work, that there was a copywriter involved, there was a photographer, and they um, show who the illustrators were, and there's even an art buyer and retouching. So giving all of those people credit is really helpful in understanding who did what. Um, then they start showing their sketches. So they show, um, you know, they even included sketches in this that weren't used, but they show that they did a wide range of different characters and motion and ideas, and then from there, they actually have photographs of them working on the little pieces that, I mean, for me, because I'm not a, a creative and, and just having seen the finished project, I think it gives me so much more insight into, oh my god, they made this little tiny expression on this man's face, and you know, it's, it, it, makes it, it makes you spend a lot more time in it rather than having one image that you can just scroll by and kind of digest really quickly. Um, and then lastly, um, we always like to remind people to be yourself, and that comes back to making a really good first impression. And um, Magdalena, am I saying it right? Yes. Magdalena, I thought you, you said that so well, and you, you ended on something that was kind of funny, and you were like, you know, I'm funny, so I'm going to end on this funny piece. And, and you are funny, and you were funny as you were sharing your portfolio. So I think that as somebody that's just looking at your work online, if that can come through and they can get a sense of like, yeah, I'd like to work with this person. She's somebody I wouldn't mind you know, staying late at the office with, and she's got a sense of humor. I think that that's so key. Because, I mean, illustration work is often, you know, there's a lot of personality in that, so don't be afraid to show it. Um, this is a project that I love. Um, Nicole, she says that she's a nerd. And just for fun, for her, for her own you know, personal interest, she decided to do these illustrations that she grouped together as different um, cards for nerds in love. And she kind of did it on a whim, but it ended up getting so much traffic, again, pointing to those um, stats on the right-hand side. And a lot of people use this, and eventually she re-uploaded them, linking back to her. She's on Society6, and she linked back to her own store so people could buy them. Because there were just these cute little quirky sayings, like, you mean the world to me, and it's pointing to the galaxy, and they're adorable, but they're very much her. And I think that that's great, because it speaks to her personal brand. Um, and I'll show you this on the live site as well, but when I say that they're for sale, now there's a, a little buy this button in the bottom, and you can actually click on that, and it'll take you to whatever she's using. So in this case, she's using Society6, but if you're using Etsy, or if you have your own website or domain name, you can link to any of that. So that can be really helpful if, within a long project of illustrations, maybe you only have one print that's for sale, like the Ryan Gosling print. Um, so that's a great way to also turn that traffic into revenue, if that's something you're interested in doing. Um, so do you have a, did anyone have questions on that part? Sure. Yeah, exactly. So we, um, we didn't actually launch with that feature. For those of you who couldn't hear, her question was just about the buy this and how it works. Um, it's not something we, want, we launched with. But we realize that there are a lot of people that come to the site that aren't necessarily creatives. A lot of our traffic isn't from people who are just there to you know, upload work and build their own portfolios. In addition to people looking to hire um, and you know, prospective clients, we also have people that just love looking at beautiful things. And their next question was often, well, where can I buy it? So we introduced the, the feature to be able to mark things as for sale, and we even created a gallery that just shows work that's listed as for sale. And that's something you can do for free, anything on Behance um, is free, by the way. But that's something that you know, if you if you're selling it from your own site, you can do that and just have say, you know, get in touch with me to buy. Or if you have something like an Etsy or a Shopify, a Society6, or there are so many different stores. But any of those, you can sync with that too. Sure. Um, I think what I'll do is, so that's everything I have to say about self-promotion, and then um, also, Jeff, just let me know how I'm doing on time if you need to kick me off. Um, what I'll do is switch from my deck to, I just want to show you a couple of things on the, 
on the website, and then from there, because um, there's some stuff I wanted to cover, so why don't we look at that, and then from there, um, Magdalena, we can go to ProSite or, or anything else that you want to see. So, goodbye file manager. Um, okay. So a couple of things I just wanted to highlight. We already talked about the fact that Ringling has its own portfolio gallery. Um, but one thing that I wanted to make sure is super, super clear is that when you're signing up for Ringling portfolios or for Behance, um, you can add work really easily to both. But if you don't want to, so let's say you have a class project that you only want to show in your Ringling pro profile, you can do that. Um, but if you want to show it on both or in, in, you know, in other galleries that you belong to, you can do that as well. So I just wanted to highlight that really quick. Um, and also the fact that we have a gallery just for illustration work. So this is a curated gallery where we actually have curators that look at every single project that's added to Behance every day. And they mark things um, in different categories. So they'll select the best work to appear on the landing page of Behance. And then they'll also place things into other galleries when we notice that there's a really huge demand for them. So we have galleries for architecture or fashion or makeup arts, um, and we have one for illustration that's really popular. And I just wanted to make sure you knew about it because sometimes if you're looking for you know, inspiration or before you've started building your own online portfolio, this can be a great place to come and see some of the work that um, you know, we've sort of curated in this digital gallery uh, to be able to, you know, just look at how they're displaying um, what they're describing in their copy. Um, if they have co-owners, how they're crediting that. It can be helpful to look at people in your own field. Um, so I'll stop again and just see if there are any questions on that stuff. If not, what I'll do is I'll log into the site and I'll show you just really quick. And only It's super simple, um, but I do want to go through just making a project for those of you who haven't done it so you can just see how easy that is. <coughs> Yeah, that's a great question. So for any of the served sites, these galleries like illustration, all of the work is selected. So it's, it's the same thing as being featured in a physical gallery or a museum. Um, we have curators that specialize in different creative fields that look for certain things. We have somebody who's with a background of you know, 20 years in illustration. He's looking at illustration work and some digital artwork. Um, and then we have somebody else who curates from Japan and she's her specialty is really fashion and textiles and you know silk screening and that sort of thing. So we have a team of people that actually select those works. Um, but you know, it's obviously it's great added exposure when you are featured on there. But the the way that you get featured is you know first have great work. But um, secondly, it's it's the, all the points we talked about tonight. So for example, they never feature anybody if they only have one image. They only look for projects that have a bit more of a description, that tell a little bit more of a story. Um, of course, there are exceptions, but really that's whenever people ask, you know, how do I get featured, that's how. Um, so if anybody, if you have your laptop and you want to you know, follow along, you're welcome to. If not, um, I'll just show you what it looks like really quick for me when I log in. Um, so. The first thing that I see is my dashboard um, that holds my activity feed. And this is basically uh, all of the projects from people that either I'm following or if they've appreciated work. Um, I can see that you know I follow Alexandra. Sorry, this isn't my computer. Um, and it's flying away from me. So I follow Alexandra, and I can see that she's added a new project. So that's showing up in my activity feed, kind of in the same way that when you log into Facebook um, and someone's uploaded a picture of their baby, that'll be there because you're friends with them and that's in your news feed. So um, I like to follow people that you know, I find really inspiring and I also think it's a great idea to follow people in your field so that you can say, you know, I love this person's <coughs> illustration work, I want to see whenever they add a new project. Um, it's just a nice kind of reminder and it can also be um, really motivating, you know, if you see like, God, someone added three new projects this week, I need to, I have, need to make something. Um, so when you're going to add work, you just click on this green Add Work button, and you can either add a project, or if you just want to show, you know, a sketch or an idea or a concept, you can select to add a work in progress. Um, I'm going to select project for today, because I think, and Jeff, you'll speak to this more, but I think that by December, the goal is really to have a full portfolio, so you'll talk more about the specifics on that. Um, so when you go to upload your files, you can do a batch upload here, and you can um, you know, select 
whatever kind of file you're using. I'm assuming for illustration work, a lot of times you're going to be uploading, you know, like JPEGs or, or finished works. But if you ever wanted to embed from a site like Vimeo or SoundCloud or use any other multimedia, you can. I just borrowed someone's illustrations for this project. Don't worry, I will delete it as soon as we're done. Um, so I did a batch upload, and I can see all of the images that I've just added here are in place. And then once I'm looking at them, I might say, you know what, I really wanted to end on the Batman and Robin. So I'll click here and reorder it, and I'll, and I'll say that, um, you know, I can just drag and drop and make it really simple so that it's just laying in the, in the correct order that I want it to appear. Then I'll click Save New Order. Um, Right here, Magdalena, this is where, and everyone, um, this is where you can mark something for sale. So if, you know, a specific print was for sale in this project, I would just click that, and then it would prompt me to link to the URL. Um, I would categorize it so it would appear in the correct place in the marketplace and so forth. Um, and what else can I show you here? And oh, and of course, if you wanted to take something out after you've uploaded it, you can delete a specific file without undoing all of the, the images or the text that you've added in. Um, and this is the same for you know, published work. So once something is showing up in your portfolio, maybe it's live for a couple months and you decide, actually, you know, I want to take some of the images out or some of the illustrations out, you can go in and do that at any time or you can un unpublish it. Um, so, before we move on, I think I'm just going to also add in a, <coughs> a bit of text just so we can see that. Sorry, bear with me. So I'm adding my text here, and this is where you can also you know, edit things like the style of the font. You can link to websites um, that are outside of the network or to your own personal social sites. So this is a great way that some people use Behance to really aggregate traffic for their own website. So if you have you know, like janejoe.com, um, something that you might want to consider putting at the end is like to see more or full work or high-res images and then link them back to your own site as an option. So I'm just showing you, you, know, you can change that up here, you can do hyperlinks and so forth. I'm going to save that and continue. Um, next in step two, you'll be prompted to select a cover image. Um, the one thing I'll say about this is that it's really important to select an image that's your thumbnail and kind of your teaser that is actually inside of your project. Um, a lot of times people will, you know, choose an image that's really beautiful and striking and, and it makes people want to click on the work, but then they open it and it's something entirely different inside, so it can be a little jarring. So just a reminder to always select, you know, here I'm just going to select one of the pieces from inside and I can change the crop on that and decide how I want that to display. And that'll then be my cover. And then you'll title your project. Um, we see a lot of this title, or untitled, or project one. Um, not going to help you get found. So when people are coming to the site and looking for amazing illustration work, and they're typing in you know, different search terms, you want to think about that. So if, it, if you want to include the client name, if it's commercial work, if it's a personal project, that's great too. But give it a title. Give it something that's a little bit more compelling. So I'm just going to call this one Batman for now. Um, in the third step, your settings, you'll have a number of different fields to select. And all of this will help you, again, get found, help your work be classified into the right search categories. So the first is creative fields. Um, so for this one, if I wanted to select illustration, I would just scroll down and find that. And um, if there are a couple of different fields that describe the work, like let's say something is illustration, but it's also digital art and you know, maybe you really were involved in the art direction for a larger concept, you can select um, multiple there. So I'll say advertising as well. Um, then under project tags, these are completely customizable, so you can enter anything here. And again, this will help in the search results. Um, so if you wanted to create, you know, a project tag for this course, you could do that. And that way Jeff could go in and search for the project tag and see all of the work that's been uploaded that's relevant to this course. So you could do that. What is the course name? <coughs> Yeah. Happy to be here. I'm a 
So maybe you would call it like Ringling Portfolio, and then you would do like 2013. And if everybody then added that as a tag, um, you could actually go in and pull a feed of all of the work that's been tagged that way, so that you know it just makes it easier to see in one place. I'm a max tag. Oh, the maximum number. Um, Oh, no, I'm sure there's a maximum, but I don't know what it is off the top of my head. I've seen one projects with, you know, like 10 or 12 tags. Um, I think that you just always want to make sure they're relevant. You know, like, you know those people on Instagram that are just like, hashtag Instagram, and you're like, oh. Like, make sure that it's something that is actually going to help you be found that's actually specific to your, to your project. So in the interest of time, I'm not going to, I'm just going to do something quick here. And then um, underneath the project description, you'll see where your projects are visible to. So these are all the galleries that I'm a part of. Um, so it's, it's asking me, you know, do I want to publish this in Behance, in Adweek, in Pantone, um, in the Walk Home Gallery? And I can say yes, because I want to get as much exposure for this project as possible. Or I can say, actually, no, I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to take this one off of everything and I'm just going to, um, you know, leave it for myself for now. So then you'll go ahead and publish, and um, sorry, you'll have to ignore what's on the right-hand side. That's only because I'm logged in as an admin. But you'll be able to you know, preview your project and um, see it as the way that anyone else will, will come upon it and find it. And at that point, you can make any changes. You can still continue to edit it. Um, but it's really good to you know, not just hit publish and walk away, but to also come back here and just, like I said, triple check the description, make sure everything looks exactly as you want it to. Um, and when somebody else comes upon your project, if they want to you know, appreciate it or add it to a collection, they can do that here. And they can also share it on any of their social sites um, and see more work by the same creative. So they can you know, say that I really like this illustration work by um, Libby. I'm just going to pick on you because I don't remember your name. And then they can say, I want to see more. And all of that will be really accessible at the bottom of their portfolio. So in the same way that if you're looking at somebody's physical book, if you really like it, you'll probably keep flipping. The idea here is that hopefully they'll keep going deeper and deeper into one person's profile. So that's what it looks like to add work um, from start to finish. Um, are there any questions about that process? Sure. The industry uh, categories, is that something that's alphabetical or can you arrange it? When you're categorizing your own work? Tags for you pick advertising and illustration. Mm -hmm. So the creative fields are listed alphabetically. Mm -hmm. And on Ringling, um, you also have filters like majors. So these were decided by your school. Um, so they should match with um, any of the, I don't know, do people have multiple majors? No. Okay, so you have one major, so then your work will appear under that one major. Yeah. Sure, so if you're signing up for the very first time, um, you could do that on the Ringling site by just clicking here, sign up, and then it's really easy. You'll be prompted to confirm your credentials, so that's your Ringling email. Um, I don't have one, so I'm not going to go through that step, but it'll prompt you along the way with then selecting your major, um, selecting your creative fields, and all of that good stuff. Um, other things that might be of interest that I just want to highlight really quickly. Um, I'm going to just find her portfolio. So Tegan is an illustrator that I really love. Um, and if you go to her portfolio page, she has a lot of works that are um, for sale as well. So I just wanted to find one. I think this one might have the project. Um, yeah, so as you're going through, you know, you can see that um, we really call out messaging the creative and getting in touch so that we're not acting as a middle person there. If somebody says, you know, I just, I love this work so much, I'm just ready to hire them or have them in for an interview, they can get in touch with you directly there. Um, they can also share your project on Pinterest or LinkedIn or anywhere else and it will come up with a visual display. Um, and you can see, again, you know, just the kind of traffic that she's getting on something like this. I think her tags are also great. Um, she tags her work with children, storybook, animals, watercolor. Um, those are all things that people might actually enter in when they're searching to find the work. Um, and so this is a print here that you can buy individually. Um, she lists you know, the price, the title of the print. It's called Her House in the Woods. And you can click on the Buy This button. 
and it'll take you to her Society6 page where you, you can say, you know, this is the size and I want to add it to my cart and check out. So again, that's re it's really just using Behance as sort of an aggregator to direct them wherever you want them to go. Um, and then we have other galleries as well, like, um, like one that we built for Pantone. Um, <coughs> most people know P Pantone company? Yes. Um, so they really wanted a gallery of creative work that was all about color because they're, they're a color company. So we built them a gallery that's a really simple idea. It's basically just top work and they, they curate it themselves. So they have people looking for you know, their favorite projects. And then you can go in and filter it and say, I just want to you know, find all of the top pink projects. And the reason why it can be great to you know, add your work into additional galleries like that is that you never know where you're going to get found. Like um, when there's a change of seasons, like for and now that it's getting a lot colder in New York, we're seeing a lot of editorial for fall. So we'll actually have um, different media outlets coming to Behance or coming to the Pantone Gallery and different sites like that saying, you know, I just want to, I want to search for themes like brown and yellow and red and they might make slideshows that link back to the work that then gives you added exposure and, and you know it's always with full attribution so that's another great way to get discovered and get found from, from the site. Um, just raise your hand if you have any questions otherwise I'll just keep going and going. Um, one question. Sure. Um, a lot of times it's on the time there's a lot of like and that's what you have. Um, what would you I mean, it, it really depends. I think in terms of content, you know, how to structure it, you, your professors would probably be better at speaking to the specifics. I know for us, um, what's really helpful is, you know, because it is it is really individual, but what's really helpful for the um, employers or even like the curators who are looking at the work on our site is if they if the project um, clearly has a story. So, for example, if somebody wants to upload multiple illustrations in one project, that's great, but um, it helps to say, you know, these are illustrations that I created in fall of 2012. They were all sort of based around this theme, and then you might have six different characters. And those characters don't relate to each other, but the description at the beginning ties them all together. Whereas someone else might say, you know, here are all of the hand-drawn logos I've done. You know, ever. and then you could have like 30 pieces. But I think that having that story that that you know creates a little bit of a narrative that ties them together. Whereas if somebody just has a project that's titled, you know, Project A1, and then you go through and you're like, well, this is character design. That looks like watercolor. This maybe is commercial work. That's when we often would never, you know, feature something like that on the front page of the site because it's a little bit confusing. It's hard to categorize. Um, it's also not clear what the person's role was and what they did on each piece. So I think that the one thing I'll say is, you know, from a, a self-promotional side is to just be really clear in presenting it. Um, you know, think of it like you would in your, in your printed portfolio. If, if you're going to have a description on the page or if you were there sitting across from somebody in an interview, what would you be saying to them? You know, if you're going to say, oh, this is something that I worked on for my final year and, and you know, this is what I was thinking about, put that in online because you're not going to have the ability to say that to them. But in terms of the actual you know, content, I think that you know, Jeff can speak a little bit more to that. Oh, one thing you wanted me to show is the resume. That's right. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, of course. Uh, you already have a profile in Behance that is not connected to an email or any of the Can I still use the same profile? Absolutely. Yes, you, so her question, if you couldn't hear, was, if she already has a Behance account, she's already added work to Behance, but she hasn't added it to the Ringling site, um, this site, you can still do that. So after you've prompt, uh, entered in your Ringling email here, the second question is going to be, do you have a Behance account? And you'll say yes or no. And if the answer is yes, you can decide to add in all of the work that you've already uploaded, or you can say, this project's appropriate, this one's not so much. Totally up to you. But yeah, we, we really wanted to eliminate anyone having to duplicate work. So once you add a project on Behance, you can add it to your LinkedIn page and it'll display there with a nice visual um, display, you know, something that wasn't possible on LinkedIn before. So that's something that's really great for creatives. Rather than just having a list of clients that you've worked with or saying, you know, freelance from 
10 years ago until now, you can actually show a highlight reel and link back to visual pieces on your portfolio. Um, so one thing that I, I, I also wanted to highlight was um, in addition to the, your projects, uh, you can also add in an about section, and this could be anything from you know, your artist statement to a bio um, or telling your story. Not everyone fills this out, but I do think it's really important if you're planning on using this site to aggregate new business. Um, because it marks the difference between you know, one illustrator and another. Oh, this person's funny. Oh, this person's interested in greeting cards. That's your chance to kind of set your objectives, set your tone, show, you know, show a little bit more of your, of your own voice. Um, and then additionally, you have your work experience. So this works like a CV or a resume, and I'll click on view all so you can see. And it, it functions like, you know, um, like a lot of other sites out there, but one advantage is that if you fill this out, and I'm an employer and I'm looking at this, I can actually go in and download your CV um, in addition to bookmarking your profile. So one way that that can come in really handy is if you're ever going to be applying for a job, online and wanting to take advantage of this as your digital portfolio because a lot of times people will say, you know, don't mail us anything, we just want a link, we want to be able to look at 200 in a day if that's the case. Um, and I'll show you what that looks like as well. So if I came over to job list, um, and we have a lot of really great companies using this right now, by the way, like Nickelodeon or the Wall Street Journal or Google, and so the posts will range from freelance gigs to part-time things, internships, you name it, but the one caveat is that they all have to be creative. They, like We can't have anyone advertising for an administrative assistant. It's all things that are um, creative. So let me see if this one has what I'm talking about. Um, so after I've read through a description, let me just see if this is, no, it's going to take me away. Hold on. Um, after I've read through a job description, though, and I apply through the website, just show you what it will do. Um, so it'll automatically populate with the information I've given the website, which is great because if you are applying for, let's say, you know, 10 jobs in one sitting, it, it can be a lot to have to re-enter it in, make sure you're entering everything correctly. So it has my first and last name, it has my email address, it knows what I'm looking for, if I've specified freelance or full-time or consulting. Um, it's also going to automatically link to my Behance portfolio. So I can say take you know, the work from there. Or you can add in your own website as well. Um, and then you can upload your resume. Or you can say, just use my work experience. And that's what we were just looking at. So you don't actually have to you know, re-upload or reformat. That'll already be laid out in the way that you've specified. And then if you want to, you can add a cover note and send your application. So that really, um, you know, we really thought about that process from the creative perspective. And it's something that you know, we're working on a lot to, to make improvements to all the time. But it's something that we wanted to be really efficient and, and also really fair. Because the whole premise of our site is to try to connect the best talent with the best opportunities. And um, this way that everyone's kind of, you know, uh, they're, they're all submitting their work in um, sort of a fair, with fair constraints. <coughs> Do I see a question over there? No, just leaning. <laughs> um, any questions on that, on the resume, on selling the work, on anything else that we've looked at? No? OK, if not, then I'm going to turn it back over to Jeff. Um, but I'll be here uh, for a while. <laughs> so, oh, sure. Sure. So when I was publishing, um, when I was publishing a project, you have the ability to to promote a work. So um, it'll prompt you with, you know, text that you can alter. Like this standard text just says, you know, check out my new work, um, and it pulls in the title that you created for your project. And then I've synced my portfolio with my Twitter and LinkedIn accounts. Um, you have the opportunity to sync it with Facebook if you're using that as well. And you can publish on all three of those places, or one or two if you want to. Um, and then also, if anyone else is looking at your portfolio, I'm just going to click on a random project here, you have the ability to say, you know, this is a work that I didn't create, but I love it and I want to share it with my audience. So I can say, you know, oh, I want to tweet this project. And it'll prompt me to tweet it from my own account, um, linking back to this person's work. 
Cool. So um, as I was saying, I'm gonna you know I'm gonna hand it back to to Jeff so you guys could continue. But I am gonna be here if anyone has a question they think of after and they want to come chat with me. Um, you are more than welcome to. Thank you.